reconciliation in Canada. Sorry. That's okay. I'm going to start again, Erin, then. Um, so we would like to acknowledge that today on all days, which is the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada, that this land on which we live in Jesse's hometown of Hamilton, Aaron's of Burlington, and mine of Terracotta, Ontario, have for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Erie, Neutral, Huron Wendat, Haidenaut Sonni, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabeg, and the Metis. We honor and give respect to all Indigenous people who have walked this land in the past and who walk it today. All right, so thank you ladies for joining us. Um, we all read Jesse's book this month, From the Ashes. Uh, so everybody's actually read your book. Last time Jesse and I talked, it was more of um, a promotion. People not necessarily had, had read it. So. Um, 19, not, not that I want you to give it away because there may be some people who see it online because we are recording it. Um, I don't want you to give away any, any, uh, big secrets for anybody who hasn't read it, but, um, just so you know, kind of like your demographic here, most of them will be asking very probing questions, having read the book. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm good. I got rhino skin now. I've been doing this for a while, so. <laughs> Uh, ladies, if you want to ask your questions live, you're absolutely welcome to. There is a raise your hand functionality on here, or you're very welcome to put your question in the chat window and uh, Raisa or myself will, will get to it. Um, but first, let me, let me introduce our esteemed author here. Jesse Thistle's award-winning memoir, From the Ashes, was a number one national bestseller and the best-selling Canadian book in 2020 and has remained a top bestseller list since it was published. From the Ashes was a CBC Canada Reads finalist, an Indigo Best Book of 2019, and the winner of the Kobo Emerging Writers Nonfiction, an Indigenous Voice Award and High Plains Book Award. Jesse Thistle is Métis Cree and an assistant professor at York University in Toronto. He's a PH candidate in the history program at York, where he's working on theories of intergenerational and historic trauma of the Métis people. Jesse has won the P.E. Trudeau and Van Vanier Doctoral Scholarships, and he is a Governor General Medalist. Jesse is the author of The Definition of Indigenous Homelessness in Canada, published through the Canadian Observ Observatory on Homelessness, and his historical research has been published in numerous academic journals, book chapters, and featured on CBC Ideas, CBC Campus, and Unreserved. A frequent keynote speaker, Jesse lives in Hamilton with his wife, Lucy, and is at work on multiple projects, including his next book, which we will definitely need to hear more about. <laughs> uh, Raisa, do you want to ask the first question? I would love to. So, Jesse, we have um, we have some of our members here from all around the world. So we spoke a little bit before you joined us about the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, which is the first time that this is being celebrated here in Canada um, and being honored. So just wanted if you could share your thoughts on that and reflect on this day and perhaps even if there's any suggestions of how we can all be a part of change and action. Sure. Uh, so I'm, a, I'm uh, primarily a scholar. I know I have this best-selling book uh, that, you know, it's, it's written in the literary fashion as a memoir, but I really am a scholar and I'm a specifically I'm a scholar of great uh, Plains history. And I look at Neheo that's Cree, or Michif, trauma, uh, genesis sites. Uh, so the dispossession that happened in Western Canada after the transference of Rupert's Land of 1870 and all the consequences that happened from that. Specifically, I look at Batash, my people, uh, the, where we fought and we lost our sovereignty against Canada. Uh, we were defending our, la our lands and our livelihoods and our relatives, the, uh, the bison. And this is the genesis site of our trauma. And in my research, what I came to know is that um, trauma, intergenerational trauma, the only, one of the only ways that it's stopped or uh, uh, remedied is through what's called public witnessing, right? People need to publicly witness what happened, right? Uh, they need to know so that they're informed. That public witnessing, in what it does is it affirms the suffering of people, right, of what they've gone through, and it gives that suffering 
purpose. When I explain this to people, sometimes that flies over people's heads, that that is what we're actually doing today on National Truth and Reconciliation. We're exposing the truth and we're collectively remembering to create solidarity and give that suffering purpose so that people can heal. And an example of this that Canada did, I don't know about America, is after World War I, there was a whole generation of young men that were killed, right? And the country was in deep, deep mourning. And so all across the country, they started erecting epitaphs to the, these their lost sons, right? That died basically in a baseless war. Like it was pointless. Nobody won that war, right? And so in that public remembering that we do every day on Remembrance Day, the country healed from that trauma. So it wasn't it wasn't purposeless. And so this is what uh, public memorials like today do uh, around things like residential schools, around intergenerational trauma, the 60s scoop. We're recognizing it finally, there's a public consciousness that this happened. It was important. We need to remember it and we need to change. And so that's what we're doing. And I also like to say that we can't wait for government or even uh, our leaders uh, to lead, right? Uh, really what the crux of the issue is uh, with what's happened here in Canada and elsewhere where colonialism and imperialism have touched is it's broken our relations, what we call our Wakuduan, helping each other in a good way, right? One side thought they could do whatever they wanted and did, and the other side faced the consequences to that. So it's up to us individually to go into the field and help service providers that are helping indigenous people that are dealing with the intergenerational trauma. And they're most, uh, they're the people that appear in my book, like me, emergency shelters, uh, emergency departments where they're facing amputation of their legs, uh, in jail systems, the young kids that come in that can't read that are pushed through their whole, all those things. I've showed you all the broken systems in my book. So I ask you, as citizens who care, if you're empathetic, to go out and help one of those institutions and those orgs that are helping those people that are dealing with the intergenerational trauma on the ground, right? As colonialism is expressing itself, right? That's where the front line of, colon of colonialism really is. Right. It's the homeless. It's the people with the mental health issues. It's the people that have broken families and whatnot. And so I ask every one of you to go and just contribute some of your time. Uh, and in doing that, I wouldn't say like put on your your ally cape and think that you're going to go fix the world. Right. Uh, we don't need any more white saviors. You know, and that's hard to hear. What we do need is constructive working together. So just go out and ask, hey, you guys need a little help. What can I do? That's it. And meet them where they're at. And they're, they're more than happy to, to work with you. I know for sure. So that's my thoughts on today. Jesse, sorry, Raisa, just quickly, Jesse, do you have any specific charities um, in mind? Um, I, I know we have a very broad um, section of um, people from all over the world, but for Canada specifically? Yeah, so my brother, Jerry, from the book, suffers with alcoholism and homelessness periodically now. And one of the agencies that helped my family, this is in the time period after From the Ashes, and I didn't talk about his traumas explicitly because it's not my business, but because Aaron asked. Uh, agencies that helped him was Name Res, Native Men's Residence in Toronto, um, Anishinaabe Homes, um, the Native Canadian Centre of Toronto, uh, all these places I would ask that you give a donation or uh, help in any way that you can. Uh, uh, Council Fire is also a really good one. Uh, just uh, your local orgs. If you're not in Toronto, you can try to find, seek out a friendship center and offer some, some help because uh, they're dealing with the people that are actually um, dealing with the intergenerational trauma and trying to heal it. So. I mentioned this before you joined the call, but 15% um, of our September sales will be going to the Native Men's Residence, which is your charity um, that you sent over and they offer emergency shelter to Toronto-based Aboriginal men. But how, how much, how important is money versus actual time and energy? 
that the time and energy is is more is yeah. more because you're you're actually building what are called relations what we call wakuduin or all my relations and you're helping in a good way and the glue to all that is kindness and love right and i'm not talking like eros like romantic love mm -hmm. i'm talking about like brotherly or sisterly love just helping in, in a good way right go down there lend a hand they'll probably give you some indian tacos and make you feel like one of the family because that's our way right it's not to alienate or do you, you can't just pay 50 bucks and think that it's going to fix itself you got to get your hands dirty and get down there and start helping that's what i believe anyways there are other people that think money is more important but not from my teachings what i've learned thank you sorry raisa do you want to no no that's okay so at this book i think for our book club was in such a timely fashion to come in in, in september where there is so much more um public awareness that's happening with the community. I mean, I grew up in the States and I had very little knowledge of what the residential schools were about. And so I, we were trying all to educate ourselves and to learn here in my family. So your book was, was so timely in the fact that it was a memoir. Um, I mean, I, I, you are so incredibly brave for sharing so much of yourself and so much of who you are and how you've become. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like for you and even and for your, I feel like I know your lovely wife, Lucy, from the book, even though I don't, but talk about how that affected you. Sharing so deeply? Sharing okay. so deeply. Yeah, yeah. First, I'm going to just uh, tell you why I donate to um, numbers. Me and Jerry are estranged, right, because of all the crap that I put him through. And so I can't help him directly. So my way to love my brother that I love very much and he hates me because he just sees me as the person that I was is to help him indirectly. So that's why I ask people to help those agencies because I can't do it. And this is uh, what happens with family with trauma. They just sometimes they don't get along. Um, but sharing so deeply was hard. It's, it's been hard, you know, um, and I also always have to remember that there was a purpose to why I shared what I shared. Right. My story is not unique might be shocking to you guys, but my story is Mickey Mouse compared to a lot of uh, Indigenous stories in Canada. And uh, I was one of the lucky ones that got to tell what I went through. And I only told you guys a fraction of what I actually went through. And I didn't tell you the most traumatic stuff because that's my story to carry, right? No one needs to see all my scars. I just showed you enough that you understood what was going on, right? And so... In that way, I, I, was, I was actually conservative in my telling of my story. And in that way, I protected myself. And I had my elders, actually a woman named Maria Campbell. She's from the same village as my Cookham and Musham, Park Valley in, in Saskatchewan. They actually lived side by side. Jeremy, he, 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 he appears in Halfbreed, a very famous book. On page 63, he's chased up the tree by an elk while they're hunting and it was a big funny thing and whatever. So she told me, she's like, never listen to the clapping hands of the audience. That's what she said when it first launched. And she said, that's your teaching and this will keep you safe, Jesse. And I didn't understand it. I'm like, wow, well, what does that mean? And so like every aspiring author, I was, ch I chased the fame monster for a while, right? I did it the first year of the book and, uh, what happens when you listen to the clapping hands of the audience is you start to believe all the things that they say about you. Oh, you're so great. You're so this, you're so that. But you also have to hear the bad stuff that comes in too, right? And that pierces your heart, right? And I'll sometimes go through Goodreads and see uh, some of this stuff. And I have to remember that teaching because she was actually protecting me because she went through it in the 1970s. And it almost destroyed her, actually. And so that's how I keep safe. Um, fame is kind of weird. I, I go to my coffee shop in the morning and they know who I am before I get there. Um, I go to the park and people come up and just talk to me and stuff. You got to remember, I was a street person that people walked over top of. And so to have all this attention, to me, I used to like it, but now it's kind of creeping me out. So... Uh, yeah, I want to just be a dad and be a private guy and, and be a professor. So this is a, was all um, by accident, if you know the story of how From the Ashes came to be. And so how did you even put the event together? I know with obviously with substance abuse, memory and time and events and things can, can be difficult to remember. Can you talk a little bit about that process and, and about writing the book? 
Sure. Yeah. Okay. So since rehab, I had collected just all my little, I guess, monumental victories, my GED, right? That little thing that I got from Jennifer Terrion from University of Ottawa that first had my name beside university that made me believe I could go to school. Um, my court records, I had to go back and look at my RCMP records. I had to go back and talk to old police officers that beat me up and many saved my life too, right? That's the reality that some people don't talk about. These cops, you know, they're your worst enemies and best friends, let me tell you, in times of crisis. Um, as I showed when I got stabbed in the face, the cops saved my life, right? So um, I had to go back and talk to old social workers. Uh, my brother's in a court case with CAS um, from what happened in Most Monster Rescue. I'm sure you guys uh, read that chapter. And uh, so he had some of those papers. I talked to my brothers and family members. And what I started to see, especially with the, co the police records, uh, was that what I remembered was different from what the police wrote down, right? And I went and I talked to my old PO, that's my probation officer. She loves me. She's one of my biggest fans and the one who gave me my mug shots. She said, Jesse, don't you know that the police don't write down what happened? They write down what gets a conviction. And you're probably remembering the truth and they're you know, smudging the record so that they could get a conviction. And so I had to trust my memory, right? from all these different sources I created the bricolage of memory that that came out and from the ashes and so I tried my best you know um I probably got some things wrong but mostly it's right so and do you have so obviously there's a lot of uh, issues and anger and there were so many traumatic things that happened to you and like you said so many things that you didn't even recount in the book do you have any residual anger left at your family or at your grandparents and do you think if they had shared some of the history of the chiefs and the resistance fighters that are part of your history earlier in your life, would that have made a difference? I don't know. I could have, I could have taken it into my like fabricated persona that I created. I was like this warrior and I could have just bolstered that. And I could have just seen myself as more of like this warrior. I don't know. I'm not angry at anyone. No. And I think that's the great mystery. Uh, most people look at me and they're like, how come you're not, you know, resentful and, you know, on Twitter saying a bunch of angry stuff, like a lot of other people. Um, I don't know. That just left my heart really because anger almost killed me really, truly. And, you know, and I seen it kill other people, real anger, right? Not just like, I'm going to send a, an angry note to an editor. I'm talking like people shanking other people. Uh, because they said something wrong or stole a chocolate bar. That's the type of anger I'm familiar with. And I just, I had to liberate myself from that. And that came through forgiveness and doing my amendment steps, which is what the book actually is. All those fragments of memory are my, my fourth amendment step of me uh, trying to get better, right? Uh, and so, yeah, there's only a few people I would say in my life that I still hold a little anger towards, like my dad, right? I'd like to find that motherfucker and beat him up. I really would. You ever hear that song by Johnny Cash, a boy named Sue? I like love that. I, sometimes I cry. Like I'll sit over my morning coffee and cry because I just want to beat him up so bad. But then I want to give him a hug and I want to, you know, find out what happened to him. Where did he go? Where did he disappear to? And forgive him. Ultimately, I want to forgive him, right? And so, yeah, that's why I don't hold anger in my heart. I think that's a good lesson for all of us. Um, I see Karen has her hand up. Yeah, uh, I'm Karen from Salt Lake City in Utah. We're named for the Ute tribe and also the home of the Shoshone and the Gushu and the Paiute people. Um, I thought my question tied into your question about what if you had known about your identity early? Because because uh, as I was finishing the book yesterday, uh, and Jesse wrote about his aunt saying she was addicted to ancestry. And I was like, no way, me too. That's why I live in Utah now, so I can work for them. And um, and I pondered like family history and getting it more into underserved communities. And I thought about what would family history mean to someone who's struggling with homelessness or addiction. And uh, I can't imagine like talking to you about it in the first half of the book and having that like, hold a lot of meaning and be transformative 
for you. So I guess my question is like, when, when is the right time? Like, is there, yeah. is there a good time or way to help um, people who are lost, you know, um, yeah. ponder yeah. their, their identity and their ancestry and their, their people who came before them? That's a great question, actually. Um, so I'm on the other side of it now. Like I explained to you, me and my brother were kind of at odds. But in 2018, I thought I could repeat the process that my doctoral supervisor did with me uh, in terms of building out a, a tree that my Auntie Vaughn created and building my own and then contextualizing all the lives of the historical figures. So I had to look at secondary uh, texts uh, from university presses, monographs, uh, journal articles, and whatnot, and other genealogical sources, like primary documents. And I started to get a really good understanding of who my family were and where I came from. And I truly came to understand the impacts and inheritance of what it means for an Indigenous nation to stand up to imperial powers in the late 19th century and the blowout that happened from that, right? I'm, I talk about that in Road Allowance in the beginning. Um, so I was ready then, right? I was sober uh, when she did this. It was 2013. I'd been sober for five years, right? So my brain was working. I wanted it. I wanted to reconnect with my mom. That was the avenue that that was our little, you know, car rides around Saskatchewan. I could just jump in the car and she could say your cook was over here. And, and so it was really soul healing for me. Now I tried to do this with my own brother a few years later, because I thought I had the template of returning like uh, meta narrative, it's called through genealogy and history to him so that he could know his orientation in society. And he didn't, he just drew an, uh, a, a picture book for, and argued with my mom and he wasn't interested in it at all, right? And so it didn't land with him because he was in active use, right? So I believe that there has to be a certain level of sobriety, um, two years plus. Uh, I would also probably urge people to start introducing these concepts in longer term sobriety. So anything over six months, uh, start to suggest, uh, make available things like ancestry or other genealogical workshops, and then get experts in that history where those people come from to work with them like Carolyn Padruchny did with me so that I understand the lives of the people that I'm looking at or the person's looking at. And what this does actually, uh, part of colonialism is that it shatters our kin groups, right? We go over there, you know, end up in Brampton, another cousin will end up in like, you know, England, another one will be in Australia and there's no uh, comprehension to who they are or their meta narrative of their family, right? It, the way I describe it, it's almost like walking in the last scene of like, let's say Transformers, the movie, you don't know what's happening. Something's happened over here. Someone gets shot over here. Movie's over. What the hell was that, right? It was just chaos. Well, that's what it's born like to be born into intergenerational trauma. And so what Karen's describing, returning genealogical narrative to people and knowing where their families are oriented, actually lets people see the whole movie of their family's trauma, right? And they can see where they ended up and where that last scene, their scene, makes sense in that movie and so it gives them clarity right and that's really important for addicts and for people in recovery and for people that are trying to heal mentally too they do this at kmh and uh so i strongly advocate for it i know other people don't believe in the social sciences and history as much as i do but it worked in my life you know and so i know that it works and i'll take that out and try to affect that so keep up the good work it's it's hard tough work jesse that leads me to catherine's question in the chat so catherine asks or says that you spoke very little about your mother jesse in the book um where is your mom and, and your brothers today i know you spoke a little bit about jerry but josh as well yeah josh is out west he's retired he, he became an rcmp it's not a good position for native people let me tell you and uh, i don't think he knew about the traumatic history of what the RCMP did to our ancestors, or he probably wouldn't have become one. And so he went into the space and it was quite violent for him. 
he um he was a constable out of Richmond and then he was in the airport and then he was a, a patrol guy on the highway and he was in a high speed car chase and uh, some kids died actually. Um, and he joined to be a cop uh, to protect people and this traumatized Josh along with what he saw every day. And he's, he was one of the first claimants in British Columbia, I believe for an RCMP for uh, leave on uh, PTSD grounds. And so he was among the pioneers, I guess they would say, of the people that made these claims. Uh, he's married, he's got a kid, he's got a house, he's doing good, he loves video games. Uh, and uh, my his daughter, Alexa, my niece, is now 14. And she looks at Uncle Jesse, actually, and she thinks that she can be a writer. You know, <laughs> that blows my mind. You know, like at that age, I couldn't even read properly. And she's proud of who she is today. She literally just stood up and one of her teachers said something rude in the class that saying, uh, trying to dismiss residential schools is a long time ago. And oh. she knows that our first cousins on my mom's side, Boogie and Marlon and all of them, they went to residential schools and they're younger than I am. So this is not very old, right? And so she stand up and like defended our people. She made me so proud today and like, I didn't have that kind of courage. I thought I was like Conan the Barbarian at that age. You know, I was so confused about myself because I just didn't know that's not going to exist for her. You know, that's so cool to me. Jerry is having his troubles. Uh, as I was saying, I don't like to talk too much about Jerry, but he's my best friend and I love him the most, you know, and oftentimes you hurt the people. <clears throat> yeah. How's your mom doing, Jesse? Yeah, my mom's good. My mom's good. We talk all the time, and we have fun times, and we use like um, like humor. Uh, that's like a Neheo or Cree way of dealing with shit, and uh, we just sometimes laugh at how hideous the rest of our relatives look, and we don't mean it. It's just like inside fun stuff. And um, my my little brother Daniel, uh, he is out in Saskatoon with my mom. Uh, he's uh, doing okay, you know. Uh, he thinks I'm like loaded because I sold a few books here in Canada. <laughs> but I have Canada is not a big market, and you don't get rich selling books here. But I don't want to break the illusion. So every time he he asks me for a pair of Jordans, which is what he always wants every four months, I buy it for him, so that he can go and show off to all his friends. I know that my mom goes into like Shoppers Drug Mart and Walmart sometimes just to hold the book up and she said this is my son this is my son right and so we have that bond now so that's kind of cool you know uh, one of my favorite parts of the book was when you talked about a little bit about the trip you took with your mom and dr carolyn and your aunt um going back through where your family was originally from and where your people were from can you just share a little bit more about that and i almost i'm hoping that there's going to be a book coming out about that Yes, I. There, my MA is already out. I'm putting out a, a university press book about the history of Métis trauma in the Morissette Arcan clan. So that my family is actually very famous in Canadian history. We were uh, part of like revolutions and uh, resistances all the way back. You know, to like I'm talking like the Revolutionary American War. There was members of the family down south. There was members here in the resistances, and so. When I went back with Carolyn to look at my family history, uh, that uh, really was introduced to me by my Auntie Vaughn in her uh, genealogy. Uh, I went around to all the different sites where my family fought in 1885 alongside Rial, right? And it was almost like the ground was sacred. I can't explain it. It's, it's like a feeling. Um, uh, it's like electricity almost, like the land remembered me and uh, it, it rained the whole time. It rained the whole time. And my mom said after I left that you were the rain, a rain bringer that Saskatchewan was crying because his son came home or her son came home. And so that's the level of spirituality that was happening. You know, and I'm not trying to be the mystical Indian, right? This is a stereotype too. Uh, but I, I can't deny what happened either. And I, every time I took a picture, it was beautiful. It looked like National Geographic, literally. Because the, the uh, it was seeing the world as I was seeing it, and I was in it at that moment, you know. And so that time is so special. We went to Cypress Hills uh, in the south, 
Uh, these are grasslands in Saskatchewan that are still biodiverse, like the grasslands were in pre-Columbian times. We went to Fish Creek, where my grandfather, St. Pierre, fought against Canadian troops. Uh, as a little boy, he was a munitions envoy. He was only nine years old. Um, and I went back to the road allowance. And in each of these spots, we had elders lined up, right, that were going to help us and help me reconnect. Uh, because once they hear that one of theirs has returned home, all right, they know the history of, of adoption that's happened to us. They just lined up. They wanted to share everything, and they, they brought me in. And the weirdest way that I was accepted when I went home, I used to be a little heavier than I am now. Uh, I'm trying to lose weight for my coming daughter so that I can keep up with her, actually. Um, uh, one of the elders was like, yeah, hey, look at that guy's belly. He must be Jeremy Morissette's grandson. Like, they just knew the, my shape, and that's how they owned me, right? And so that was the homecoming that I had. And they had like a barbecue waiting for me. And they acted like I wasn't even gone. That was the most beautiful part. Like there was just an empty lawn chair and they handed me a burger. Like it was nothing, you know? And so, yeah, beautiful, beautiful time in my life. So congratulations on your upcoming daughter. We heard from Aaron that um, you are, and you mentioned as well that you're going to be a dad. Yeah, I'm scared. I'm terrified, ladies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I want to run. I'm a runner, right? Like you guys saw, I've, I literally run across the continent, right? And so my job to end my trauma in my family is just to stay. It's just to stay and provide and protect. That's it. You know, all the literary awards and the academics, that's all bullshit, right? Stay. That's what I have to do. So. Yeah. I'm sure Lucy is happy to hear you say that you'll be staying if that's your yeah. main job. Yes. <laughs> So I think all of us have a vested interest in you and your life after reading this book. It feels like we just got to know a little bit of you and a little part of you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, Lucy and about the first meeting and how it was when you reconnected with her? Yeah, Lucy was the girl on the hill, right? With the cool girls. Yeah. I was a nerd, right? I wore Bargain Herald stuff. Like, I don't know if you even remember Bargain Herald. I look pretty old. I look older than I am. Uh, so I had, you know, uh, I just remember how nervous I was to say hi to her and that she was kind. I remember that she was kind, you know, that meant the world. Um, I went my way. I went across this to the bad high school, right? Across, it's called Central Peel. If you guys have ever been in Brampton, yeah. she went to what's called North Park, which is the good school. That's where all the good rich kids were. We sold drugs to the rich kids from our high school, right? And so she was amongst those people. And she went on to have a good life. She actually became a Starbucks barista after high school. She went to uh, Australia, skydive. She was 18 years old. So she's full of life and adventure. And then she went to Simon Fraser in uh, British Columbia. And she was there, actually, at the same time that I was out there in the car with Leroy. I didn't know that, of course. And uh, the night that I fell off the building and shattered my foot, she was at the party, right? Coincidentally, because she was wow. my brother's, Jerry's friend. Jerry had dated this girl named Mary, and they were best friends. That's the connection. That's how she came back into my life. And so I was hitting on her at this party, right? I saw her, I remembered her. She's sexy, right? I love red hair. I just have a thing for red hair. Uh, have all my life. And she wasn't interested at all. She didn't even remember me. I wasn't even a nerd worth remembering, which, you know, anyway. So I fall off the building. You guys know the drama. I end up in like rehab and I get this message when my grandmother died. My grandma was the closest person to me. Um, <clears throat> more so, way more than my mom. And uh, she really, um, her loss kind of almost like sent me off uh, into relapse. And um, I guess Mary and Jerry had told Lucy uh, that I was in rehab almost like uh, better. And so she sent me an email message and it was just consoling. She's like, oh, I hope you're okay. I know your grandmother died, hang in there. And it was just simple like that. But like in that, there was like a kindness that I hadn't felt in like forever, you know? Uh, it almost reminds me of those like Renaissance paintings, you know? Like all my whole life was all this darkness, right? And then, the way that those old masters used to paint is they would use uh, sharp light, you know, 
like Rembrandt and like uh, Mona Lisa to bring uh, the the picture to the fore. And so that's what her kindness was. It was like looking at Mona Lisa, you know, that's how stark it was. And so like brilliant. And I remember that and we just started talking and yeah, that's how we got together. And, you know, I got to be honest, like at first I was a guy in jail. So like I had one thing on my mind, uh, really what guys in jail have on their mind, but we have, we can work with this, right? Like she, she hooked me in and, and like, I fell in love with her and started selling, sending her poems. And she, now she runs my business. She's the one who does all the logistical stuff. I'm just a creative. So she's the business brain of the success of From the Ashes actually is her success along with my, my team. I just show up places and talk shit, right? This is what I do. So uh, if you really want to know like how everything happened, you have to talk to Lucy. Uh, experts should talk to Lucy too of how she was like a peer support live-in worker and helped me uh, reconnect into society. She taught me all these things like accessing, how to drive, how to build up my credit, how to ha have a bank account. I didn't know any of these. I didn't even know you know, basically what like cell phones were, I fell off the map in 98, 97. Right. And so they just weren't part of my world. And so she walked me through all those things. And uh, she's really, really a wonderful woman. Uh, and I'm lucky. I put on that song lucky man by the verve every every morning. And I think of her, I do. And because uh, I know that's like the only thing I've gotten right in my life is her. She, is, she sounds absolutely amazing. And, and the poem that you put into the book that you wrote for her, was so touching along with all the other poetry that you put in there. Are you still writing poetry? Will you be publishing a book of your poetry? Yeah, I am actually. I have, I'm in negotiations right now. I sent it off. It's, uh, it's going to be called Stars and Scars. So all those love poems that I thought had flown into the ether, Lucy was plucking them like berries in her basket and collecting them. And she put them aside. Right, all those love poems, those early, and so she gave them to me last year, after, and she's like, you, "These should be a book, Jesse. These are your best writings." And I had this other stuff, like I write a lot about my memories of jail or on the streets and stuff, and so we've come up with this concept called Stars and Scars, right? They're love loan, uh, love poems from jail, and uh, or rehab. There was a minimum security jail set up, and. Uh, all my scars, like the other scars that I didn't show you in the book. And so, again, I'm trying to use that the darkness to contrast the light to bring out and make the emotions clear. That's what I do with my poetry. We definitely, I know I, for one, and I'm sure most of our members will be dying to read that when that comes out. So we're looking forward to that. Um, I see Angelica has her hand up. Hi, I'm Angelica. I'm in Washington, DC. Um, I loved your book um I your story was so hard to listen to but I wanted to see you succeed and I was like well obviously he has succeeded because he wrote this book but um uh, my my chapter and I we um here in DC we talked about um about Lucy and how much we just loved her and it's very obvious how much you love her with the way you talk about her and um I just wanted to tell you that we were all very moved about with when you guys did your own marriage ceremony together, just the two of you, like, it was so beautiful. And um, I don't know, I just it I feel like your story feels your story tells shows us like what the human body can endure, and what can happen when you either believe in yourself, or someone makes you believe in yourself like they see something in you which I feel like I don't want to speak for you of course but I feel like that's maybe what Lucy did for you she's showing you more of, of who else you could be to be proud of yourself and so I hope you are very proud of yourself for this book because I think it's moved a lot of people and I just wanted to say that oh thank you thank you I I try not to be proud uh, it's not part of our teachings uh, but I try to be humble uh, you know, and I do pride myself that I wrote something that people read. So, uh, but Lucy, I don't know if you guys are aware in, in Latin, that's light. That's what light means. And so uh, that's the way I think she shone into my world and uh, gave me a chance. So, 
Yeah. Thank you so much. And Sorry, I'm getting here. sappy <laughs> here. I don't mean to. <laughs> oh, you're talking to a bunch of women. We love sappy. That's not a problem. Um, and Jesse, I think it's admirable. I, I know you don't want to be proud, but I think your your humbleness and that came through the book loud and clear page after page um, is, is absolutely inspirational to anybody that's reading your book. And um, I already have not only am I giving my copy to my mom, but I bought two other copies that I'm giving to family members because I think we all need to read your story. Um, and speaking of stories, Cindy is asking, are there any other books that you would recommend that we would read or should be reading? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm going to put them in the chat. So Hold on. In, in my own moccasins by Helen Knott. You've read like the male story of dispossession. This is a better book than my own. And it's a shame that it hasn't gotten more press. She's a wonderful writer and an even nicer person that lives her life through kindness. And so I would go and get this book. T-K-N-O-T-T, her last name? Yeah. Um, also, if you want to understand a lot of the policy, I'm a history, I'm a, um, a professor first. Go get Bob Joseph's primer uh, on the Indian Act and how this has impacted and what it actually did. Uh, it's important. And then finally, this is a rare book. Uh, it's on the dispossession of Métis people, uh, which doesn't get talked about in a lot of the national discussions around reconciliation, but it's called uh, Towards a Prairie Atonement. And it's actually about the dispossession of uh, St. Madeline's village in uh, Manitoba uh, that was uh, ethnically cleansed um, by, the, uh, by the Manitoba settlers and the government. And uh, yeah, it's a very violent uh, history that not many people know about. So what is up next for you? You've talked about you have, it sounds like you have a poetry book coming up and that you're in the works for, and then your other books that you have coming out for us. Yeah, I have my uh, history book about uh, Métis trauma that's already basically written. That's my dissertation that I have to finish to become a Dr. T, uh, which I, I want to do uh, before December, but it's very hard in COVID to access archives, right? Um, I'm supposed to be writing a book about my great uncle Ron's life. He was a professional bank robber uh, in uh, the 70s and 80s. Those people that I talked about were real heavy dudes, right? From his gen, my dad and the, the flower delivery service. And if you ever want an idea of what that life was like, go watch The Town. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of that movie. That's what my uncles were like. And so I'm going to be writing a native version of a bank robber story. And this is actually the effects of trauma on the older generation, right? They were the ones who actually bore the, the brunt of it. And expressions of it for Indigenous males were criminality, violence, uh, addiction, a lot of the things that appear in my book, but more severe. And so that book is actually going to be better than my own because he just had a more adventurous life. You know, he's in currently in jail. Uh, he's been what's called DO'd. So he's a dangerous offender because he just robs too many banks. He's not a goof or anything. He didn't do anything sexual or anything weird like that. The state just doesn't know how to contain the man. Right. But really his story is a testament to the damage of colonialism, uh, the loss of traditional male roles, right? Uh, they were, they lost the land, they lost their roles as hunters. And so they lashed out against society. Uh, in the 70s and 80s. And so I'm going to write that book as an advocacy piece. That's my next piece uh, of writing. So I know for, so I'm, uh, my book club that I chair for Gurley Book Club is in Etobicoke, um, but I live in Caledon, which is in Peel. We're just outside of Brampton. And for myself and for a lot of members in our book club last night, when we were talking about your book, um, the, the areas when you talked about some of the alleyways and some of the places, those are places that we've walked by, that we've driven by, that we shop near, that we go to, or the bus station in Brampton. It's amazing that there seems to be almost this other world that's happening right outside my door as I'm, you know, holly hobbing, skipping along, collecting, you know, moms to put on my front porch. And this is just happening right behind me um, that I don't even see. Like, I it's almost impossible for us to to see how these two worlds coexist and I for one want to be more aware so that I'm not just walking by someone and not being able to offer a hand and to help like how would you suggest doing that in in a safe way and in, in, in a non-offensive way to someone like I don't want to offend somebody either 
Well, I want people to understand that homelessness is is a product of middle class apathy and greed, first of all, right? It's because what happened in the 60s, 70s and 80s, there was a reorientation of the way that people looked at housing as instead of just a place to live or habitation, they started looking at it as a place to park their money, right? And flip houses, right? HGTV, all that like uh, renovation porn, it's all part of the same stuff, right? Uh, you know, uh, the, but when they're selling houses in Hollywood and California, it's all tied into the same mentality. So I would challenge people if they want to help homelessness in places like Brampton and other suburban places where hidden homelessness is actually higher than it is in urban centers, that you have to confront neighbors when they have illegal um, rooming houses. That's where I drifted in and out of as a youth. There's no protection, tenancy protection then, and the landlords can just kick people out. And they move, they'll go to the Wilkinson Road shelter up on Steeles, or they'll go to the woman's shelter up on McLaughlin. Those are the places I'm talking about, the old shelter up on West Drive, right? And that's where they gravitate to, or they just sleep on top of buildings that you're not even aware of downtown. That's where they're, they are. They're sleeping on the roofs of buildings instead of down on the streets. And this is a policy problem in the way that people have looked at their houses as places to make money from, rent out these illegal rooms and uh, apartments. And, and so the problem will only get worse until there's a, a law that restricts that. I would also encourage people to vote for any party that wants to push through uh, a, a, a right for housing in Canada uh, that has legal teeth behind it, right? So compelling the government um, to give everybody a right to housing, what that does is that uh, service providers like shelters or even rooms, landlords, can't kick people into homelessness, right? Because they will be legally penalized for that. And so the closest platforms that I see to that were the Liberal Party and the, the, the NDP here in Canada. But without that uh, political intervention, there just won't be any change, right? There just won't be any change. And people will continue to see their houses like bank accounts. And that's the real problem. So I know that we're... And, uh, can I say one more thing oh, about that that's really important? Absolutely. I don't know if people are aware of this, but the rise of things like Airbnb have, has actually increased homelessness uh, by uh, doubled it, tripled it, uh, because it took away the, a quarter to half of the rentable spaces, like overnight within a three or four uh, year period. So if you're partaking in Airbnb, you're part of the problem. That room should be rented out legally to someone who needs a place to stay and not as like a place to generate nightly hotel fees for yourself. So I ask people to turn the lens around and see what's actually producing the problem of homelessness. Yeah, I think what you've just shared is eye-opening as well as what's been in your book. So I think that I, I'm thankful for that because it certainly changed the way when I walk around on the street. Um, we had our last question is coming in from Karen. And so she's actually, this is a question that we all wanna know is how is your physical and emotional health? Um, you've had a lot that's happened to you. So how are you doing with everything? Well, I'm better than I have been in years in years um i had like a mental breakdown i guess in january of this year just from sharing so openly and honestly right and some of those comments the good ones i let them in and some of the bad ones they got in too and that was too hard for me to take uh because i really am just sharing so that people can learn i, I really don't you know and also i shared so people knew what happened to my father part of me sharing um uh, was my grandfather on his death, but I didn't put in the book, was that I continued to look for his son, right? And so that's why I forced Simon & Schuster to put his yeah, missing, missing persons person. at the end of the book. So every book is actually a missing persons poster. It's like three-year-old Jesse is going around to each lamppost and putting that up. You know, I'm still searching for my dad. And that took a lot out of me, of course, right? Of course it would. And so... I got a really good trauma therapist. 
My cat is my primary caregiver along with Lucy. I, I have lavender that I put on. I don't know if you guys noticed, I put it on at, at the beginning of the talk. And in front of me, I have pictures of my loved ones. Here's Lucy in Venice when she was hot and sexy when she was young. And so I look at that. Hey, she's at, still hot and sexy. I'm she sure. still is, she's still, even with the, you know, and here's um, Alexa. I keep a picture of her in front of me. And I also usually keep like a stress ball, a stress ball. And, uh, you know, that's the, or now I've been going for walks, uh, trauma somatic. And so I go for very long walks. And that's how I, I've been dealing with my trauma. What's the second part of your question there? Sorry. Um, that's okay. I think I've forgotten it because you're, are you wearing a necklace or is that um, a talisman? This is my bead. I, I was given this for writing the definition of indigenous homelessness. Again, this was another fluke. I didn't mean to do that. It just fell in my lap and I said, hey, let's do it. And this is what the community in Manitoba actually gifted me. Uh, I forget what her name is. I should uh, find out. Uh, and she beaded this. And this is a thistle, right? This is supposed to be a thistle. Kind of looks like a ray gun shooting like stuff out of the top, but it, it's close enough. I think it's pretty fly. So I wear it, you know. And uh, it's it's me. It's like a, a matey and bead, and so that's what that represents. It's gorgeous. Well, it's been my my honor and privilege to be able to chat and chat with you this evening for you to share what you've shared, Erin. I will turn it over to you. Yes, Jesse and I talked. Jesse, it was two years ago now, if you can believe that. Um, and I went back and I listened to our to our chat all those times ago, and yeah. Um, things have changed drastically for you. I mean, you, you're a whole new man to start with. There's half of you there. <laughs> yes. And uh, you're expecting a baby girl. And um, we did an interview with Jesse over email the other day. And he wrote that um, him and Lucy used, and I, I, I um, assume this is public knowledge since you wrote it in your interview, <laughs> but you used the money from your book sales to do IVF and uh, you wanted to thank your readers for helping you bring new life into the world, which when I read it, I started to cry <laughs> because it was so touching. Yeah. yeah, that's what you guys did. You helped bring my daughter into the world. The, you literally put a roof over my head. You know, so all that money that's coming is going to heal the intergenerational trauma and create our family. And th well, I got to thank you guys all for that. You know. Well, Jesse, I hope you take some time off and um, especially in December when uh, your new bundle arrives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wish us well. She's apparently a pretty big potato. We, we <laughs> went and had our ultrasound and she's in the 98th percentile. Wow. So we're just... Uh, yeah yeah I, and she had this huge foot i don't know if i do if you guys follow me on like on my uh, uh facebook i put a the sonograph up and her foot is big so she's going to be big girl maybe i get her into basketball or hockey or something already um, planning her sports future <laughs> well thank you yeah, so much yeah. Raisa, and thank you again jesse for your time and for everybody for joining us and for reading this month's book and really, Jesse, I hope we're doing this again in two years, um, talking about whatever else is uh, coming up. Thank you. Thank you all for seeing the light amid the dark in the book. I appreciate it. Hi, hi. Thank you so much. You. It was very nice Thank to you. meet you.